Hello there guys, what is going on Son of Chelsea? Back here again for another edition of the Every Other Saturday podcast. Hope you're doing well and keeping safe wherever you're watching or listening to this. Uh, got a great guest on today in Alex Goldberg. I'm pretty sure if you're active online for Chelsea, um, in the Chelsea community, whether that's Twitter, YouTube, uh, podcasting, you'll know who Alex is, the host of the Byline podcast. I've been lucky enough in recent weeks to be a guest on his podcast. A great guy. It was great to collab with him. The last time he was on a channel was over a year ago now, um, pretty much at the start of the 1920 season. So it's great to catch up and speak all things Chelsea. We go in depth not only on the history of his byline podcast, speaking about the podcast, the growth of it over the past year, his feelings on the online Chelsea community, also relevant Chelsea topics like N'Golo Kante, his best position, Mason Mount, the ascendancy of Christian Pulisic and what that's like for an American watching Chelsea, and then a little bit on the future of Chelsea and youth players in the first team. Hope you guys enjoyed enjoy this conversation. I enjoyed being a part of it. If you did, please give this video a like. Also rate and review if you're listening to the podcast unedited. But I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Let's get to it. Okay, so Alex, thank you so much for joining me on the channel today. Um, I think it's been over a year since we collabed on the channel. Um, So much has happened and changed, not only in terms of Chelsea and football, but just the world in general. Um, and of course, I have to say thank you as well for getting up so early American time. I don't know if people can see this on, on the channel, but um, it's obviously quite dark there, about five-ish in the morning for you, about 10 in the morning for me at the time of recording. So thank you for that. Um, how has it been for you over the past year? Because the Byline podcast has exploded over the past year. I mean, I've been very lucky recently to, to be a guest on the podcast and you've got some amazing guests on there. Sort of your trajectory in terms of getting bigger in the Chelsea community and, and really growing your platform. How has it been? It's been great. It's great to be here, by the way, Daniel. It's good to be back on. It's always nice to collaborate with you. Yeah, it's been really, really good. It's been one of those things, though, where I even just said to my wife the other day, like, if I take a second to maybe stop and realize, hey, you know, just had Azar Begovic on for the fourth time, and he's going to be a regular co-host of mine once a month. Like, if I stop and think about those things, it's pretty damn surreal because, Like I often say, I mean, I just pretty much started out as a Chelsea Twitter account. I was in broadcasting, but I totally didn't know this would take off. So fast forwarding the story and everything. Once I started the podcast, obviously the reception, the excitement was incredible. And I made sure you're going to do a podcast, especially make people pay a small monthly subscription. You got to make it good. You got to make sure the guests are good. So I made sure it would start off really well. And you know, I did have confidence it could have longevity to it, like, and it could pick it up. Like, you see a lot of podcasts start, and maybe the first couple months are good, but then they run out of ideas, they run out of steam. Maybe they just don't like it as much. They don't like doing it consistently. But first of all, I kind of put a lot of my eggs into this podcast basket, and it went really well. So why would I want to, you know, abort it? And I just love doing it, Daniel. So. All the hard work you put into it. I think the hard work is not when you're on the microphone talking to a guest. That's the fun part. Like that is literally the part where I'm living out my dream in ways. I think the hard part is literally just schedule. It's doing all the behind the scenes stuff, scheduling, maybe a couple people you want to have on the podcast don't respond to you for a couple of days because, I mean, you're trying to go for really busy people, right? And then they respond to you both at the same time. So then it's about scheduling and then it's about thinking, hey, does this make sense to have this person on at this time? But that's actually become fun for me as well. So I was saying to my wife, it's nice to stop and appreciate these little things along the way, like who I had on or really nice feedback. However, to make anything good, a YouTube channel good, your job in general, but like this podcast for me, you kind of have to have a go, go, go mentality because this is such a competitive business, Daniel. And I really like, though, that the Chelsea content creating world is getting more podcasts, is getting more channels. I do view it as competition, but not really, because I feel like all the new ones popping up have their own allure, have their own uniqueness, also are usually bringing something positive to the community. So actually, it just makes me better. And I really think overall, we just need as much great content as possible. So it's going great for me, but I also kind of like the way that maybe it's spilling out into the Chelsea community in general. So yeah, it's been a great ride. I definitely agree with that. And and what I like about your pod is sort of the the mix you have of 
these amazing guests, whether it be, you know, Harry Redknapp, Asmir Begovic, um, sometimes getting uh, players sort of family involved as well in terms of getting the back, background to some of these players in terms of Chelsea. Um, we were just, you know, speaking about cer- certain guests you were you may be getting on the channel soon and it's exciting. But I also like not only getting on those really exciting guests, whether they be journalists as well, but also mixing that with Chelsea creators and Chelsea fan voices as well. I think there's a nice balance and you could probably, just because you're getting the big guests that sort of attract a lot of attention, and I like the fact that you've always sort of stuck to the to the thing that you're you're a part of the Chelsea community and you want to give a voice to Chelsea creators as well. I, I think that's a real positive too. That's one of my biggest things is it's great having, and I'm not name dropping the name drop, but it's great having a Martin Tyler on or somebody like that. However, yes, he's a real person, but that's not real life. Like you don't speak to those people every day. Also, that is one very specific view of the football world. The people we converse with the most are people on football Twitter or just other content creators. So it's important for me to tap into that or else that's kind of fake because like, I don't talk to Martin Tyler and Peter Jury more than I talk to people on football Twitter. And really, I, football Twitter gets its own bad reputation and some of that is very earned, trust me. However... I learned so much having, I think I learned the most, honestly, having other accounts from the Chelsea community on because having them on a podcast, proper debate, not like you do on Twitter, you really hear interesting views and perspectives. And that's good for me selfishly. But then, yeah, what you were kind of saying, like, I also like to give sometimes a platform to voices I think should be heard by more. And it's worked out. It's worked out fairly well. I think that's probably one of the things I'm most proud of. I keep using the story of Elizabeth Hellenek, who now has done fantastic for herself in the Chelsea community. And by no means would I ever, ever take even 1% credit for her being more known now. But it was a good example of I wanted patrons, so my listeners to send in voice notes. I'm doing this now again full time, and I'm starting to discover some really good voices now on the podcast. But I tried this a long time ago on the pod and Elizabeth sent in a good voice note and yeah, and then I had her on the podcast as a guest in a round table, like I call them and people really enjoyed hearing her. And I think she got confidence from it. Forget what it did for me or my podcast, but she got confidence from it and kind of ran with it. And that's the thing is maybe we can find people or people can find themselves and think like, Oh wow, I really like speaking about Chelsea. So yeah, that's one of the big allures, and I'll never stray away from a Chelsea roundtable, like, ever. If I go four episodes without hearing someone from our Chelsea content world or Twitter, I think I'm doing it wrong. Mm, definitely, I agree, and it's great to see how real, po- really positive I think the community has become. You know, I think, obviously, there are negative elements that we all see from day to day, but I think, in, in general, I think the fact that there are so many voices and those voices want to collaborate and not sort of be in opposition to each other, I think it is a healthy thing because maybe in the past we haven't had that and I think it will only make all of us stronger to be honest in sort of this independent sort of creator sort of world we have now where people new sites popping up whether that be writing podcasting making videos so it's, it's it's exciting one thing before we move on to Chelsea uh it's probably a tough question for you to answer because you've had so many guests and done so many episodes favorite guest on a channel uh sorry favorite guest on a podcast you know you'd think I'd be better at answering this question by now since I have gotten it a handful of times mm. um all right, my, my cop-out answer will be Demba Ba. And it's just the easy answer for me because, I mean, obviously I was excited to speak to somebody who I really liked as a player. I, I truly did. But also, you know, he's one degree away from Eden Azar and some of our favorite people. Like he and Eden are great friends. And uh, Demba always, to me, just as a fan viewing on the TV, he always seemed to me like a likable person as well, not just like a player who was fun to root for. Dare to Demba, that whole phase. So just to have him on, if it was for a half hour, it would have been great. But, I mean, I'll tell this story until I'm blue in the face. I had him on, didn't know how long it would be for. It would take every opportunity to get as much out of it, but I wanted him to enjoy it. And I used to use not Skype, not Zoom. I used something called Uber Conference to get my guests on. Don't ask what it is. It's just a very outdated version of what we use online here. And Demba, really, no one had ever had trouble, hence why I was still using it. But Demba was having trouble connecting to it. 
It was taking like 45 minutes and I was freaking out thinking, is this just going to be the end of my chance here? Is he just going to log off? We don't know each other that well yet. So he might just think this is my Sunday. I'm not going to spend another 45 minutes trying to log on. So I thought on my feet, I'm like, okay, I know Zoom's popular because the pandemic had just started and Zoom was like erupting. So I was like, Dumbo, you got a Zoom account? And I didn't have one. He's like, yeah, no problem. I got one. I was like, okay, so do I. Why? And I made one in two seconds and boom, we did a podcast for over three hours. And it was just him like hanging with, and I'm not appeasing myself, but it sounded like he was hanging with a mate and he was just having a great time on a Sunday telling stories and really just treating it as if we were sitting there in the same room, just talking about anything, anything. So I have to go for that one because to have a three plus hour chat with Demba Ba where he sounded super comfortable and everything, that was really a dream come true. Yeah, Demba Ba, I mean, he was, he's one of these players that I think when you actually look at the amount of time he was at Chelsea, he, he it's one of these weird things for football where you may not be like the best player at the squad. You may not have the most talent, but with the way football works and a narrative of football, you can score massive goals and be remembered forever, even if you didn't score as many goals as some other players. And the fact that he scored the goal against Liverpool, the fact that he scored the goal against PSG, um, I think there'll be so many memories for Chelsea fans because he was involved in big moments. I think like Michi Batshuayi has sort of the same thing. He'll always mm. have the West Brom goal for him in his Chelsea career. And I think that's that's an amazing thing. But it's nice to to know that footballers where we sort of sometimes can see them as sort of out there and not, you know, connected to the real world that, you know, Demba Ba, real guy, real person. And he, he mm. gave you the time to sort of speak like, like you were a friend. And I think that's really cool. Um, one person I think we're both fans of, or at least supporters of very vocally on social media is Mason Mount. And I know, you know, in terms of actually sort of speaking about your uh, Twitter career, you know, your career in terms of podcasting and broadcasting, speaking about Chelsea, would you say that like Mason is the player you've been, I guess, as most like vocally supportive of, of the most with like hashtag Mason Mount Monday and seeing his career, not only in terms of Derby and Chelsea, but before that with Vitesse and growing in the academy? I mean, it really has been an amazing uh, few years for Mason. Yeah, I mean, listen, I am at this point very not afraid of just speaking my mind and I'll back whoever the heck I want to back. It doesn't matter what trend is going on in social media. So uh, probably it, Mason's the one that I've kind of attached myself to the most. But I will just say quickly, some of that has been totally run with on Twitter on its own. So I would say for people who maybe don't like me or don't like my style, they want to try and attach Alex Goldberg and Mason Mount at every turn, which is probably a little too much because if you have followed my account for a few years, sure, I speak about Mason when I think it's appropriate, which is often I won't hide from that. And I'll do actual serious posts about Mason, but I also do ones like Mason Mount Monday. So yeah, I, I love Mason. I'm, close with the family. I mean, I love Mason. However, I mean, I've been obnoxiously loud about Reese James for a few years now, like obnoxiously loud about Reese James. And I always wonder, well, why do they not tag me with Reese? What, just because more people universally agree that Reese is ready for it because Reese is cooler because Reese appeases the younger demographic a bit more and Mason doesn't. So they don't want to say that I ever was a fan of Reese way before everybody else was. So I listen, I'm not looking ever for credit. It's just funny to me that it is marketed as if I only talk about one player, which is a little ridiculous. Like once again, Callum hudson Who who is the most annoying? And I'm not giving myself any credit, but who is, who is unbearable that sorry season talking about Callum hudson Adoy? Alex Goldberg was unbearable. He was annoying, obnoxious, beyond belief, talking about Callum hudson Adoy. And that's never wavered. You know, when that whole thing happened the past few months about Callum and Bayern and Frank and Callum got all these messages going, where's your energy on Callum these days? You just changed it because you're too loyal to Frank and Mason and not Callum. What? I, I do Callum tweets every week. I love Callum. You know, I'm always between me and you, like close with a little bit the family as well like i love callum you know uh, absolutely so yeah i would say in short 
Mason is probably the one that I just feel like, yeah, if there had to be one, I, I've hitched my wagons to him and I'm, I'm proud of that. And, uh, yeah, I, I think that when you back Mason Mount, Daniel, I think you can probably relate to this. When you back Mason Mount, you're kind of in it for the long haul. Because if you have belief in the player and you also understand his mentality, like I have no fear about big backing Mason Mount the way I back Mason Mount because I know that in the long run, Mason Mount will make me look good. That's it. Yeah, I think the, the thing with Mason and... It's frustrating. And you see it a lot recently, of course, there's been uh, a lot of... I spoke about this with Matisse, my last guest on the channel, um, sort of about sort of this debate and conflict between Mason and Callum on Twitter. And it's just, I mean, it's so toxic and it's it, it gets really tiresome. But as you were expressing there in terms of people, when you support one player, um, people take that, read that statement and think that, that you're sort of not supporting other players. And it's just, it, on. it's such, on. it's such a yeah, straw man argument. You can't support Pulisic if you support Hudson Adoy. You can't support, I don't know, a number of players if you support Mason Mount. Kovacic is kind of the new one, right? And it's just like, hello, we signed up to have a squad where, fine, maybe your favorite isn't in the starting 11. You're probably going to have your second favorite, your third favorite, and your fourth favorite in the starting 11. That's a beautiful thing, Daniel, between me and you. For years, I mean, I liked a handful of players in this Chelsea team, and Chelsea were still, I mean, it, you could put out 11 Alonzos, and I was still going to be really upset if we lost and then really happy if we won. But Eden Hazard was a huge, huge thing for all of us when he wasn't in a starting 11. We all were like, oh, this game could be brutal to watch. Like, our team was so, de- especially in the attacking phase, for us to get that entertainment and that extra bit of excitement, it was very Ed independent. Now, fine. Pulisic, if he needs, I'm just saying, and, and we might get to it. Let's say Pulisic still doesn't start on Saturday because Frank's still easing him in. We probably have a po- you know an extra positive that could come from that. We want to see Pulisic, but maybe it means Callum gets another start, right? Like we're in a different era where we need to understand that. It can't be this player versus this player when they're all quality players. Let's just enjoy it together collectively. And also, I think um, personally, I, you know, I think I've opposed for, for years now, you know, any sort of abuse to players. And it's it's just so weird. It's like just because I'm opposing abuse to one player doesn't mean I'm I'm sort of supporting the other. I mean, I remember mm-hmm. writing pieces about sort of defending Jorginho at sort of the height of the toxic days under Sarri and it's it's just weird and it's the same with Murata and Bakioko. You know, I've gone on this on my channel a lot of time, but it's um it's weird. But I think with Mason, I mean I'm a I always say this when I get questions about Mason and recently about his positioning and sort of where he should be in the team and will he fit in the team. Um I've always my answer to the question has always been Mason will find his way into this team. Don't worry, because Lampard trusts him. I mean, to me, he very much symbolizes the best of Lampard's Chelsea. Uh, Would you agree with that? Because I think he's such a great symbol for for what Lampard wants to do with Chelsea. Yeah, I was thinking yesterday that having Mount out there, and it's still nothing that some of Twitter wants to accept, but having Mount out there, even let's say he's playing out of position, first of all, Frank's going to find a couple positives from him being in said position, whatever that position is. Say it is right wing, right? Well, Frank will say, and by the way, people need to understand, Frank understands that Mason's preferred position is an eight. That's not news to Frank Lampard. I think sometimes Twitter wants to pretend like Frank doesn't even know that about Mason. Of course he knows that. Oh, well, he played I him there at Derby, know, didn't he? He played him a number. He had the right. number eight shirt at Derby. All right. If Mason and his father have told me that on multiple occasions, I can bet my bottom dollar Mason's told Frank that. And Frank already knows that. He's no dummy. But say Mason plays at right wing. Well, Frank will think, okay, but now he's a little bit higher up the pitch. So now he can at least angle when we're off the ball, when we're not in possession, he can angle the press at a certain point. And if, you know, we're in possession, he can certainly be a decoy with how he. Sorry, the TV came on. That's just raw 530 in the morning type stuff. If we're in possession, people need to understand that Mason's very smart about where he shows for it. So you want Kai Havertz in the 10, right? So that's great. Mason at right wing, that's not ideal. However, Mason's positioning often, if he is not receiving the ball, it's almost decoy where he's creating space for others. And if he is showing for the ball, he will try and show in pocket. So 
Frank views having Mason out there as a positive in so many ways. And uh, of course, on Twitter, it gets chalked up as, oh, just because he's a chicken with no head running around and that's all it is is pressing. No, I mean, it really are small things, but a lot of them that he brings to the team every time he's out there, no matter what position he's in. So I think, Daniel, to answer your question, are they just kind of a better team with him out there? Is he kind of a representation of Frank's football? Yes and yes, because he puts across, of course, what Frank wants to do. But a lot of what Mason does is contagious. So I guarantee you when Mason is pressing high up the pitch or he, you know, a big thing for Frank is win the ball back. You lose possession. I want you winning the ball back as quickly as possible. Have we noticed how good Kai Havertz is? He's not Mason in that department, but Kai Havertz now for Germany and for Chelsea, at least in that Carabao Cup game, he has created a goal off of pressing, making a tackle, making an interception. And that is going to start being really contagious. And I'm not saying Mason taught that to Kai, but Mason is a representation for Frank always on the pitch. The Athletic has written about it this week of what he wants his players doing. He doesn't expect them all to be exactly wired like Mason or Espilicueta. No, but if he believes in his ability, which is a big thing here, folks, he does, then everything else is really something positive for Frank. And he feels like that can kind of grow into the squad. So I always say, if you don't believe in Mason's ability, and we really can't have much of a debate, I guess, because then I can't even argue with you not wanting him in the team if you don't believe in his ability. If you do believe in his ability, you need to realize that then everything else he brings, it just kind of multiplies the effect he can have. Maybe at the end of the game, it's not a goal and assist for him, but you need to realize he may have made it easier for someone else to get a goal and assist. I think that the thing is with Mason, and it was so apparent last season when he wasn't in the team, how the energy level of us just significantly dropped I mean it got I think it got worrying at a point because you never want to sort of be a lopsided team and rely on just one player same thing quickly to interrupt you same thing happened at Derby the season Mason had an ankle injury so I mean his one season at Derby he was fit for most of it but I want to say into the new year for a couple months he was out with an ankle injury and Derby also lost a lot of life and they started to look not like the same team and mind you Daniel he was like 19 at that age, 18, 19 that season. So, I mean, that speaks volume. So already there in the first season with Lampard, sure, after four or five months of him being in the side, he goes out and a team, Darby, they had they were a young team, but they also still had plenty of senior players. They started to look like a different team. So it's contagious. It is. And I, I hope to see more of that this season. And I just think Mason will find his way into the team because you got to understand coaches have their favorite players. They have players that they trust and rely upon. And I don't un- I don't know why people don't understand that that's happened with every coach and we're not at Cobham. We're not at training. You know, if I was the coach, as Frank says himself, and he expresses this, it's not only about what you do on a Saturday for the 90 minutes. It's about what you do at Cobham every day, every single day. And Frank's sort of professionalism in his career is so much um, a part, I think, of his coaching and his coaching philosophy. He will not stand for players not putting in 100% and it's a very basic thing. But I think people need to understand that about Frank's selection. Just because, say, Kovacic or someone else you think may have superior technical ability, um, it, Frank may look at it and go, he hasn't put it in a training this week. And that's not a slight on that player. It's just the way he goes about things. 